morning Ball State students. My name is Katie Deichler. I'm joined by my teammate Austin Kloss to talk to you all about sales technology and how to interact with Gartner Research, um, specifically with the goal of helping you understand the um, technology landscape that's going to surround you as future sales professionals. So to introduce you to myself, um, my name is Katie Deisler, and I'm currently a university recruiter. With so what that means is I spend a lot of my time working with students across campuses in the Midwest, like yourselves at Ball State, and with the goal of helping you advance in your sales careers and ultimately join Gartner. I started my career with Gartner straight out of college and joined our sales team in the Fort Myers, Florida office before moving back to my home state of Michigan and taking over the Michigan and Ohio, Indiana territory for the recruiting team. Happy to introduce you to my teammate, Austin, and I'll let him introduce himself. Yeah, how's it going, everybody? Uh, my name is Austin Kloss. Uh, I went to school at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, from there, I, from right out of college, I went to um, Atlanta, Georgia, and worked as an inside sales rep for AT&T. Uh, I got promoted to go to Minnesota uh, to be an outside sales rep for AT&T. Uh, from there, Minnesota was a little bit too cold for me, uh, so I, I, uh, I went out to Fort Myers, Florida, and I was a business development manager uh, selling a lot of the technology research that we're going to cover today. did that for about two years, uh, and, now, and then I moved into the university recruitment team uh, where I sat in Houston, Texas, uh, and I recently this year got promoted to a senior recruiter, uh, and now I sit in Austin, Texas, uh, covering all the Texas schools here, um, and yeah, very exciting stuff. So Austin and I both have similar context to provide since we both started in sales with Gartner before moving to recruitment. So keep in mind that our perspectives, yes, are colored by our roles as recruiters, but ultimately come from a foundation of sales. So before we start talking about sales technology and research, it's really, really important that you guys have a baseline understanding of Gartner and what we do, because ultimately that's the the driver behind our research, right? Our goal is to help clients is why we create the research that we do. So the dictionary definition of Gartner is that we equip leaders with indispensable insights, advice, and tools to achieve mission critical priorities. Ultimately, what that means is we help businesses grow. The gray boxes along the bottom of the screen are some of the reasons we're really trusted and, and well known by our clients. So within Gartner, we have a few major business units. The one that you'll most typically hear university recruiters talking about is the orange research bar. This is where the sales roles that I recruit for most often fall. The way that we sell our access is a annual license-based subscription. So the best way to think about this in an analogy is a gym membership or a Netflix subscription, something that renews and is based on a per person and based on your needs. Um, our additional business units that we hire into are often consulting and conferences, although those tend to have less um, new hire opportunities because of the volume. Anything to add here, Austin? So yeah, I, I like how you said the, the Netflix model and the gym model. I think it's more like a gym model um, because uh, the difference, a lot of people think that Gartner is consulting. Um, and I think the big difference between Gartner and a consulting firm is that we are not a project-based company. So you're gonna, you're gonna come with us for the whole, for, to hit all of your goals uh, for the whole life cycle of your relationship. Whereas for consulting, you might go there for just one project. I think that's a really big differentiator between us. Um, we're more of that building a strong relationship with the client and working with them three years and years and years rather than just one project. Absolutely. So Gartner got its start as an IT specific research and advisory firm. And something that's important to note, especially if you're looking toward your sales career with us, is that we now serve almost every C-level function. So it's really hard to think of a company that doesn't have these main business units listed in gray, right? IT, supply chain, marketing, sales, um, et cetera. For the sake of our conversation today, though, we are focusing in on our IT and technology clients because that's where a lot of this sales technology research comes to play is within that IT and technology sales team. So with that in mind, again, keeping in mind that we're zoomed in on that IT box, this um, sales technology team focuses on two main types of clients. Those are the technology vendors. 
So companies whose main business is to make and sell technology, right? So thinking of Salesforce, Microsoft, Google, Apple, et cetera. And then the end users, companies who use technology. So think about it pretty simply, anyone else, right? Um, financial institutions, higher education, like Ball State, Legit hospitals, retail stores. Legitimately anybody else in the world who does not make technology. It could be anybody, like restaurants, bars, like you mentioned, Ford, Bank of America, hospitals, anything. And it's um, a unique perspective that Austin and I bring because I worked on the vendor side in sales and Austin worked on the end user side. So we have experience coming from both when we're talking about, about sales technology. All right, for me, this is the most important slide because it actually talks about how we do it and what we do to help our clients. Um, so we provide three main things when it comes to a Gartner product, and these things are pretty much included in every single Gartner product you could find. So the first is trusted insights. Um, I like to go through an analogy here that makes this a little bit more realistic for college students. So let's say that your professor assigned you a research paper and you needed to find some scholarly peer-reviewed research. You would probably go to a resource through Ball State whether a library database, perhaps Google Scholar, but some sort of online resource where you would have access to those research articles. On the left, that's the same way our trusted insights function. Our clients have a username and a password, and they can log in and get Gartner research anytime they want. Now, thinking about writing a research paper, sometimes you can find all the research on your own, but maybe you need help from someone who knows what good looks like, someone who's been through that assignment before, um, in that case, you might go to a campus tutor, you might go to a, a teaching assistant or your professor for office hours to figure out exactly what to do next once you've done the research. In the middle box, that's what our clients have access to in discussions with experts. Experts who have been through that situation before and know kind of the best path to follow. Finally, on the right, practical solutions. So this is one that I didn't have an exact analogy for, but something that I compare it to loosely is a project rubric. You are gonna have some sort of criteria for success from your professor for an assignment. Um, so in Gartner's case, this looks like templates or tools that our clients can use to actually do things. Um, so one that I like to talk about a lot is a product launch toolkit. Our clients have access to a step-by-step -step guide for how to launch a product, what the timelines should be, and who should be um, in charge of each initiative. Um, anything to add here, Austin? Yeah, and I think another way to break this down really simply, and this is, you know, when, when, I'm, when I'm breaking down with, with the people I talk to is, let's say that if you're a college student, you have a, uh, you're, look, you're interested in math, whatever that is, maybe just algebra, and you, the trusted insights, the research, that's the algebra book. So you're going to read that book and you're like, okay, this kind of makes some sense. But then for that strategic advice side, would it make more sense to speak to the author of the book and have him walk through each individual math question that you have? That's what Gartner is. You're going to be reading the research and then using that research to get a better understanding. And then you're going to be using that strategic advice, talking to the author of that research to have him talk about your unique company and how we can help your unique company. And then, the practical solutions are really just toolkits, things that every company can plug and play with, um, where they can input their information and it shows them right away where they're at with the rest of the market, where they're at with the rest of you know, their competitors, uh, people of similar size. So those are just like kind of like a one size fits all, like this is gonna help you understand where you're at. The research is gonna help you understand what's out there. And then the strategic advice is gonna help you how they can take all that together and bring that to life for your business. Absolutely. So when we think about this conversation, we're gonna zoom in specifically on the research document. So keeping in mind that now we are now in one section of Gartner and in one section of what we do. Um, as we zoom into this, we're gonna really be focusing on what this means for you as future sales professionals um, and how sales technology plays into Gartner research and really what that means for you as you enter the workforce. So ultimately, research is important because it's one way that companies can make decisions about what technology to use. Sales technology is certainly included in that, but really when we're helping IT leaders, we're focusing on all technologies that uh, businesses use every day. Things from 
payroll software, online meeting solutions like we're using right now, um, hard and soft phones, CRM systems, certainly, um, any sort of like AI for sales, any system that a company uses, Gartner can help make those informed decisions through research. Our research is reliable and actionable, and it's 100% unbiased, meaning that of all the vendors we write about, no one is paying us to have a certain opinion. No one is running sponsored ads through Gartner. We are completely unbiased, and therefore, we're really, really reliable when it comes to making those decisions. And so what this means for you is, as a future sales professional, you're going to have access to all sorts of technology. Um, through this class, I'm sure you've learned that the sales landscape is changing and there's multiple different types of technologies that really are, are created every day to help sales professionals do their jobs better. And so as this is happening, be aware of um, the technology you may or may not have access to and use that information as you're interviewing for jobs and internships. Ask questions about how sales technology plays into those different sales organizations. So like I mentioned, our research is unique and, and very different than using something like Google. It's independent and unbiased. Um, it is peer reviewed and written by multiple experts prior to ever getting published. So the same way you wouldn't use a Wikipedia article in a research paper, um, Gartner goes through a really rigorous peer review and collaboration and editing process before it's ever published. We have some rigorous methodologies, which we'll talk about here in a moment. But essentially, those methodologies are very intentionally designed to help our clients make the best informed decisions about technology. And finally, our research is role-based, meaning that the CIO of Coca-Cola is going to have access to the very different research than the CMO of a regional hospital chain. Anything to add here, Austin? I would say one thing that's really cool about Gartner's research and you know me selling this for two years is is that it is, it's very highly sought after, and I've never lost a company or never had a company say, you know what, we're gonna go with a different research company. Like they understand that Gartner's is the best. Um, and I think that's one of the really cool things about Gartner's, like we are the industry leader and we take every measurable, everything measurable to make sure our research is number one and stays that way, which I think is really cool. Absolutely. Okay, so the first research methodology we're going to talk about is called Gartner's Magic Quadrant. This is probably our most well-known research, although a lot of people, um, especially when I'm interviewing, they'll say, oh yeah, you have that magic square thing, um, but not really know what it is. So the Magic Quadrant functions, it's, it's a scatter plot, right, if you're familiar with math. It's a graph of vendors in a particular technology space. So for example, CRM systems. It allows clients to see kind of a quick overview and snapshot of the space on a company level, right? So understanding what companies sell CRM systems, what companies are doing it well. The X and Y axes are based on their ability to execute and their completeness of vision. So ability to execute is quite simply like, how well do they do what they say they can do, right? Are there bugs in the system? Do they have the features that clients need in order to be successful? And the completeness of vision is more about long-term, are they innovative, are they doing things that are unique and, and are, do they really have a forward-looking vision? So here's what a magic quadrant looks like. Again, this is the CRM magic quadrant. Um, a lot of Gartner research is actually published online, so you can just Google Gartner magic quadrant and find a lot of it uh, because clients will pay to repost them. So you can see here Salesforce is, is in the top right all the way down to Sugar CRM in the niche players quadrant. I'll have Austin elaborate a little bit more here on, on how clients actually can use this. Yeah, so I think a really cool thing, and we really can't do this right now, um, but you can, what you can do is scroll over, with, let's, if you're looking at this online, and you can scroll over and highlight one of the, like, so Salesforce, click on Salesforce, and then you can see that they have about a thousand research documents just on Salesforce. Talk to you about the uh, different analysts who just focus on Salesforce, how to implement Salesforce. I think that's a really cool thing that this that the Magic Quadrant can do. Also, this is not the, okay, I got to go to Salesforce now. No, th what this is, is this is a starting point for a lot of companies. So we, you be showing this, they can read up on all the different information about the different CRMs on this sheet. 
Um, and then what we'll do is you speak, like I mentioned before, this is just the book. Then you need to speak to the author of the book. That's going to be the analyst. From there, what, what he will do is like, hey, you know what? Salesforce might be right now, they might be killing it. But here is, you know, for Oracle, for example, might be better for you. Here's why. They do this and this and this. Whereas Salesforce, they don't do this and they have too many features that you don't need. So this is just a starting point. But if you could look at this like inside our portal, it really brings it to life, which is really cool. Absolutely. And speaking of more customized research, right? Let's say an analyst gives you three CRM systems that would be a good fit for your particular needs. Another research methodology that we, our clients can use is called critical capabilities. So this is a completely customizable research document. Um, as you'll see, it has products and services as well as best fit to use case. What a use case is, is just a particular way to use the technology. So um, for example, I'm gonna use an iPhone because I'm, I can talk about that pretty easily. Let's say that one individual wants to use their iPhone for the camera, right? They're focused on Instagram and focused on photography and blogging. They need to have an iPhone with a great camera. Someone else might be focused specifically on um, email capabilities, right? They need an iPhone with pretty fast speed and, and a lot of storage. So those people would have two different use cases in terms of how they intend to use that same piece of technology. So first thing our clients will do with this document is pick a use case that best fits their company needs. Then they actually have the ability to go onto the document online and rank what's most important to them. For example, maybe they're looking for the most cost-effective solution. They can rank price as most important to them. Maybe they're really focused on a particular feature. They can rank that feature as most important. Ultimately, you, once those weightings are done, our clients click a button and it kind of spits out rankings on a one to five basis for which technology is the best fit in order of those rankings and uses. I'm gonna chime in here as well, Austin. Yeah, and, and just a little bit, so you can put in, I, I don't know if you mentioned this or not, but you can put in that for me, let's say that I was looking at a phone, I pretty much just want, like, I want a phone that has really good, um, you know, really good sound, really good, uh, really good screen, a really good refresh rate, really good brightness. So I want all of that. I can put those at like a really high, like I want that about 80% of my phone. I want that. And then for the price and the camera and everything else, that's like small percentages, like one to 2%. So it's, it's, you can rank, yeah, you rank them, but you also put the percentage of what you want on there. So mm -hmm. for, and that really goes into play with, with different companies. Mm -hmm. So a, uh, a marketing company might put in that they want this CRM to do this specific thing, and they might have a completely different product that pops out than a oil and gas company that they put this, when they put what they want their CRM to do, it's, it's a, like literally, it's like the, 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 uh, their needs are completely reversed. Mm -hmm. So that's why this is, that's why the, the um, magic quadrant is like that first step. And this is like the second step. Okay, now let's make it more unique to mm -hmm. you as an individual and you as a company. Absolutely. And this is also really useful for smaller companies who maybe they can't afford the full Salesforce solution, right? Or maybe the best is too expensive for them. So they can really figure out what is going to fit their needs and maybe get rid of some of those features that they don't need and therefore don't need to pay for it. Now, the last methodology we're going to talk about today is really about how companies can be on the cutting edge of technology, how companies can create a long-term innovation plan based on um, this cycle and, and kind of the adoption of different technologies within their industry. So the hype cycle, as you'll see here, um, again, it's another graphical representation. And along that line where you see innovation trigger, peak of inflated expectations, et cetera, there will be different types of technology um, plotted at different times. And those times, those dots on the graph represent different, um, both of course, times in the maturity of that technology, as well as time frame in years for when most companies in that industry will have adopted the technology. So for example, um, autonomous vehicles is probably in the peak of inflated expectations, perhaps going down the slope a little bit. Um, something like virtual meeting communicate or technology, which we're all using right now, is gonna be over here in the plateau of productivity because 
pretty much every company um, has access to something like that. So really it's about um, the leadership of a particular company being able to look at a document like this and plan out their future technology purchases in order to, to continue to innovate and continue to be on the cutting edge. Yeah, and I think a, a, a main thing of this is like, you don't always want to buy when it's at its peak. That's like the tough part. You're like, hey, just so you know, like this technology right now is at the highest it's ever probably going to be. Why don't you wait a couple months, maybe a year to make sure that this is, that this is going to be mainstream. I'll, and a good example of this, and Katie, I don't even know if you, uh, when did you graduate again, Katie? 2018. Okay, so you might remember, but so back in, back up like 10 years ago, when 4K was just coming out, the TVs, there was also like 3D TVs, like where you put on glasses and it was really like every TV had that, like every D, you know, Blu-ray had that, like, hey, it's got 3D. That is like literally nowhere to be found now. Um, like, and I bet you, if you look back 10 years ago, 4K and 3D TV were at the top of that, uh, the peak. And 10 years later, 4K obviously has made mainstream, not even 8K, but 4K is like the standard now. Mm -hmm. And 3D technologies, the 3D TVs are nowhere to be found. So yeah. th this is a really good document to be like, hey, we want to make sure that this becomes mainstream and this has staying power before we invest. Because the reason they're coming to us, these companies, is they're not coming to us to pick a couple laptops or a couple cell phones. Like, they're coming to us to make multi-million dollar decisions. That's why they're going to pay Gartner so much money to make sure they get these decisions right. So that's why this document is really important to it, one, shows them, okay, what's going on right now? But two, I need to make sure I get the decision, decision right and that our company is like lasting for the next 10 or this technology lasts the next 10 years. Absolutely. All right, so finally we're going to briefly talk about the technology areas we cover. Um, Austin and I are not experts in these technology areas, no. but I just this list here to show you a little bit of the scope that Gartner covers, right? So I do have a link there if you want to explore the full list of magic quadrants, but we cover not only technology related to sales, like I said, but technology related to really every facet of business. Um, and it gets pretty specific. So you'll see for CRMs, we have a lead management focused CRM and a customer experience focused CRM. Again, going back to what each company needs and, and kind of ranks according to those priorities. Okay, so this to me is the most important part. It's, it's why do you care, right? Um, we've been talking a lot about those sales methodologies that, I'm sorry, those research methodologies that the leadership of the companies you're probably gonna work for are most likely using, right? So as a future individual contributor, why is this important? Um, something that's, you know, thinking about my role as a recruiter is ask these questions during your interviews you'll want to know how those companies are innovating in order to set you up for success using technology. Um, additionally, just being aware of the different technologies that are out there, taking any time to research. Certainly this class has put you in a really competitive position to be fluent in some of those technologies or at least have recognized the name of those technologies prior to entering the workforce. Any additional thoughts here, Austin, before we open up to questions? So I would say that I would say that you really want to make so like the cool thing, and I don't really want to focus on this, but I want to say one of the cool things about Gartner is that, and I think Katie, you can speak to this as well, is that when you come on board with Gartner, you get access to every single research document that we have. And when you're when you're preparing to meet with clients, preparing to research different markets, you have the world's largest research database at your fingertips. And that is one of the coolest things. Like you, it's about a two million, you have about two million dollars worth of research that you can access at any time. So you're gonna learn, you learn so much, like not even like thinking about it. Like I know so much about retail technology. I know so much more about like we help the client do a build <coughs> IT uh, or a um, an AI audit. And like I learned so much about artificial intelligence. Uh, it's it's really cool the amount of research you have and like just the stuff that you learn just kind of in the background, not even thinking about it. So yeah. that's one thing I want to mention as well. I, I don't know if it really, it doesn't really go on the slide, but it's just, it's so cool that you get this. Like I, anytime I want to, I can go on Gardner's research portal and just learn and learn about what's going on, what's 
what's happened in the marketplace, what's going to be happening in the next 10 years, what cool technologies are at. I mean, I could look up my, like, if I know people who work at different technology companies and see, like, oh, looks like their technology is doing really well. Like, yeah. it's really cool. So, yeah. Um, we also write about current events, too, and the impact on business. So Gartner recently has been putting out a ton of information about coronavirus, right, and how that's going to impact the different um, areas of business. So we're helping clients in real time and also from, from a perspective of, you know, us as employees and professionals and people in this world, we have access to that information. Um, I have a team in Europe and they were talking about Brexit and I go, well, hey, log, in, log into the Gartner portal, see what we have to say about it. So. Um, that information is, is cool and for the perspective of just being a lifelong learner and continuing to develop, having access to that is, is pretty darn cool. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. I, I, I've loved my four years here. It's been, it's been awesome. Uh, awesome. Well, at this point, Deva, I'll open it up to questions sure. um, yeah. from the students. And of course, if students at any point have additional questions for me, um, I um, so one of the things, thank you, uh, Katie, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah Austin, thanks. Katie and Austin, can you hear me? Yeah, so yeah. essentially uh, we have been told that these classes, sessions have to be asynchronous because not a lot of the students might have access to uh, uh, Wi-Fi and everything else, or they might be, you know what I mean, that they might have mm -hmm. to have the resources that uh, make it difficult for them to be at the same time when everybody is in. So uh, it will be a recorded session. Uh, the students uh, can always ask questions, so I'll encourage them to ask questions to you. But I do have a couple of questions and a couple of points which I want to make because uh, I'll first make a couple of points because I want to link it back to what they've seen in class so far. Okay. But I would like to point out one thing where uh, Austin mentioned earlier about 10 years ago where he talked about uh, 3D TVs. I was one of those first suckers who actually went and purchased those 3D TVs and it was horribly expensive because <laughs> we thought it was going to be the case. And the only cool experience I had was I think that was the year where they had the Beijing Olympics, I think. And the opening ceremony was just out of the world, just watching it in your living room. But barring that, there were not too many movies that were coming out with 3D stuff. So essentially, again, as I said, I can understand that the technology, I think the, the main point that we need to illustrate there is that there's so many things happening in the world of technology. There's so many uh, trends happening. There are so many new ways by which you can conduct your business because of technology. And keeping track of all these things is going to be next to impossible for most organizations who where the people and the employees, uh, the CIOs are mostly focused on making sure that they get the business uh, up and running, running smoothly, that they don't necessarily have the time or the resources to be investing in what are cutting edge technologies, what are cutting edge things, what are, especially if you take a look at what is happening for the students, especially for those of you using Zoom or people talking about Zoom, you must be seeing what is being said about Zoom right now about data not being end-to-end -end encrypted. What does it mean? It's got to do with things like security. Now, I'm sure that if you had decided to work with Gartner, Gartner would have possibly said, hey, maybe you should take this into consideration. So it's not that Gartner is actually going to tell you that you need to make this decision, right? And so essentially, that is one of the things that for the students in this class, this is a class on sales technology, but actually what you're seeing in this session is if I am going to be working for a company, so if in this class, we've talked about marketing automation, we've talked about sales enablement softwares, we are going to be talking about uh, customer success soon, but when you talk about all this and what you're actually going to be seeing is that there are multiple players who actually provide these kind of competencies or platforms. And I believe that all of you guys must have read the article. You actually had a small assignment on this article which said avoid the four perils of CRM. It is an older article that most of you summarize it, but actually if you notice the first thing that they have within the first page is they quote a study by Gartner, the very company that is actually talking to you right now. But this is way back in 2002 where they talked about in 2002 that 55% of most CRM implementations are failing. So essentially to put it in perspective, Katie and Austin might have been either in kindergarten or maybe <laughs> just going into middle school, and I was finishing up my PhD at that point in time, uh, essentially to say that Gartner has been around for a long time, but this aspect of technology being out there to help 
enable the sales organization. Okay. Again, what you'll see once you start working is while this class is about sales technology, technology is making a lot of inroads into how businesses are doing their day-to-day -day activities. And because of so many developments, you need support. So this is a very nice example of, hey, if I go to work for a company or you're going to start up, essentially if that's the case, what kind of company, what kind of platforms do I need? What kind of technologies do I need uh, to make sure that this is the case? So you need to take a look at this session not from the viewpoint of sales technology itself, but actually to understand if I have a lot of technologies to choose from, which kind of technology would I want to be focusing on? And that is how you need to try and take a look at it. And I hate to do this in this, but again, Gartel is a very big player in this. We also have Forrester. So essentially, again, you have different players doing it, but Forrester is also well known, but Gartel is very well known, but Gartel is the one that comes and recruits our students. So we're very, very thankful for that. But again, either way, uh, making and relying on uh, such difficult decisions is always hard. Um, if you don't mind, Katie, can you just give me access to, can I just present two slides because I want to put this in perspective to the students about what this means for why it's important for players like uh, Gartner. Right? So folks in my class, You'd have seen, um, wait, I'm going to see how I can, can you, can I have a share screen? Huh? So on the okay. top where it says file, edit, share, you'll hit share content. Indeed, indeed, wait, let me, oh yeah, file, edit, share, let's say share web browsers or would, would this work? No, it's not my web browser. Oh, well, that's fine. I can also show this as well, right? Yep, so I, I can, can see your, your web yeah, browser. Yeah. So let's go in and say, um, Smart Tech Landscape. So for those of you who are there, just to give you an idea, hopefully you can see this. These are all the technology vendors. You may not realize this. These are all the technology vendors just active today in providing marketing technology solutions. Just to give you an idea. Right, so essentially, if I am going to be working for a company or I'm going to be starting a company and I have to make certain decisions about how do I want to advertise, just look at the fact that you can't even see how crowded the space is for you to make sense of who is the right player for me to be working with. So the question is, this is where the value of Gartner comes in. So if you were to go in and think about how this would work. If I were to go in and I make a mistake in choosing the wrong technology, I'm gonna be spending a lot of money on paying for this, installing it, and not getting any use from it, right? Now, mm -hmm. if I were to go to a company like Gartner, then I would make more informed choices to say, hey, this is my business case, and that's where the analyst that uh, Austin and Katie were talking about, that's where the analysts come in, where they can actually tell you, given your current business situation, what might be the best possible solution. Now, again, you need to understand is that it's not always that you might want to have the analyst, but that's where, again, if you go back to the magic quadrant, that if you do not want to have access to a, a person to actually call you and advise you, you can still make your own decision by saying, okay, if I want to go and get the magic quadrant and I go to Gartner, then I would say in advertising and promotion, especially in mobile marketing, can you give us the, the magic quadrant for that? So what Gartner would do is that it would take all the players active here, and then they would put them on the magic quadrant. And then you can decide for yourself without necessarily getting advice from a Gartner consultant to actually say what might be the best for you. Now, if you're willing to pay a little bit more, then you can actually have access to the Gartner consultant. And that is how you need to make sense of the presentation that Katie and Austin made into understanding how you do this. This is just marketing technology, right? I'm going to, um, wait, I'm gonna stop this one. And for the others, I'm gonna share one more. And this is uh, share, let's say content, uh, right here. How do I share content? Yes, yes. Okay. I'm sorry about this because I do not have one from Gartner, 
But just to give you an idea, these are all the, just like you saw the MarTech, so you'll hear the term MarTech and you'll also hear the term sales tech. Sales tech is becoming much more in terms of what are the technologies available to help the salesperson do the job on a daily basis. And this is a competitor of uh, Gartner. So Gartner, my excuses, but I don't have a, a file like this from you. But the idea is you need to have one of these services to actually say, okay, if I want to go in and go into sales enablement, this, by the way, for the students, this is one of the uh, topics that we covered in this class. But again, these are just the certified top 100. So which means that there are much more players that you have in the sales enablement space. So I'm sure that if you go and put it in, that sales tech is gonna be the same in another five, six years where MarTech was five years ago. So which means that you can choose to work with Gartner, you can choose to work with whatever, but what you need to understand is that, yes, should I do the decision myself or not? So that's why I think it's very interesting that if you choose to work for a company like Gartner, well, of course, you as a salesperson at Gartner, you're going to be using some of these very technologies. I'm sure that they have their own CRM system. They make sure that when they talk to the CRM system, they're connected to LinkedIn Sales Navigator. If you're looking at LinkedIn Sales Navigator, they can actually go in and then it's connected to either Zoom Info or things like that where they can pull up information about who they're going to be talking to. Uh, so essentially, as a sales organization themselves, they have actually access to a lot of tools. So if I were to ask Katie, do you do a lot of uh, both online training sessions where people can just go follow some videos to learn, and then later on, you will also have in-class sessions, correct? For training yep. the salespeople, right? So yep. that is again- so, um, Our training is based on both classroom and experiential learning, so. Mm -hmm. And they'll do a lot of in-person with our training team. We have um, online modules for them as well as um, experiential learning where they're shadowing. Indeed, right? And I'm assuming that the coaching also happens remotely as well through some of the platforms that if, they are, if the manager is not there face-to-face, -face, they could also coach them as well. So essentially, in this class, that is normally what would go into sales enablement. So if you say there's a learning component, there's a coaching component, you see what I mean? And there's a selling component. Mm -hmm. So essentially what you see is that Gartner is a company that uses technology for itself, but it also helps other companies make the right choices about what technologies are going to help drive their business. So essentially working for a company like Gartner, especially in today's uh, days with digital working, working from home, remote working, the impact of technology is going to be huge. Companies are going to be looking at digital transformation. Uh, most of you might, might have been seeing the meme on uh, Facebook that says, what drove the final uh, digital, the move towards digital transformation in your company? Was it the CEO, chief executive officer? Was it the CIO, chief information officer, or COVID-19? And essentially, you see this meme where people are circling COVID-19. So the way organizations are going to rethink the way they're going to digitally work much more in the future, I really think the future is really bright for companies like Gartner because you're going to have more and more vendors coming in and more vendors coming in would automatically mean that not everybody is going to be an expert. You need the advice of companies like Gartner. So again, you need to understand this session more from the viewpoint of how do I choose or how do I work with a player like Gartner to try and choose the right vendors or right platforms, technology platforms for my sales team and my marketing team to work with. So essentially, it's a long winded part, but I just wanted the students to understand how this fits in into their class as well. So again, I'm going to stop at this point in time. Uh, so no, wait, stop sharing, yes. Actually, I have a couple of questions for uh, Austin and Katie as well. So, so when you think about this, so when you, uh, I think Katie, you mentioned you were in sales, right? You were in sales mm -hmm. and uh, especially, right? Uh, so when you were in sales, could you talk about some of the technologies that you use? So for example, did you use LinkedIn Sales Navigator? Uh, again, the idea was we use LinkedIn Sales Navigator to get access to uh, decision makers or contacts and stuff like that. Yeah, so um, I can't disclose our vendors, sure. but we have a CRM system that we, it's custom built for Gartner based on our sales process. Mm -hmm. um, that includes, it's all linked with our contract software, our sales yeah. process, prospecting, it's also linked to our inbound leads. 
um, we did use a service that would help us get contact information from like LinkedIn. So it's a browser add-on. Um, and then we had um, obviously our video chat tools, um, yeah. our, um, there's a really cool um, technology that's from Gartner. It's called Gartner Everywhere. And it's a browser add-on that if you Google or Wikipedia anything, there's a little sidebar that pops up um, from Gartner that says, you know, here's all the Gartner information about this topic. Fantastic. Are there any uh, missing options? Yeah, so one thing that I really liked was you put in a company and like into the CRM. Mm -hmm. And then if, it, if somebody changes titles, somebody they hire somebody new that's in like a senior role, it mm -hmm. automatically tells you about it. Um, so it has like a LinkedIn add on where it's like, oh, what's this thing? Or, you know, Austin yeah. got promoted to CEO or yeah. CIO. And it's like, okay, I need to figure out what's going on there. Fantastic. Right? Did you also get these kind of trainings or things like, you know what, this is the kind of wording we should be using in our emails. This is the kind of wording we should be. You see what I mean? That it, essentially to mm -hmm. train you. Yeah. You yeah. Have, so pre built ones in the CRM. And then we had um, yeah. meetings every month that went through best practices, either yeah. you know, a portion of the sales process about a new update in the CRM and how we could use it. Um, and then if we had team files that if you had a really good prospecting email or something, the whole team could access. Like, I would, for, for us, it would be like if you had a prospecting email to supply chain companies, to marketing companies. Yeah. Like, yeah. And then, um, like Katie said, you have more than enough on like literally every step of the sales process. Like it's, if you like information, like learning, like your know, coaching, Gartner yeah. is your place. Indeed, I love it. Because for me, one of the things we are talking about is, of course, is how is technology being used within Gartner itself, right? So one of the things which I'm curious is because the students are going to have a class soon on, well, a class yeah, remote. They're going to watch some videos on the concept of customer success, right? Mm -hmm. Do you actually also have a customer success team? And is there a career path for people who begin as SDRs, BDRs to transition into customer success, or is customer success more the senior profiles? Yeah, so our customer success team, we call it our client services organization. Mm -hmm. and there's multiple different roles and different kind of levels. Um, ultimately, it's the role of the customer success person is based on the product that client has. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's kind of our most high tier product, they'll have what's called an executive partner who is um, a former CIO, has really that high level experience, yeah. uh, all the way down to someone who is more of an entry level candidate that's really focusing on that account servicing and getting value. Um, regardless of the product, that customer success individual, um, I refer to it to my students as like sales without sales. So yeah. your account manager is gonna be doing a lot of the same things that your client services manager would be doing, is, finding value, doing that constant discovery needs identification, overcoming those challenges, right? Aligning that different research or those different analysts. And um, the difference for us is that sales people ask for renewals and customer success people do not. But there is a, a heavy correlation there between the two. Good, because that's what they're going to see soon. The idea is that because a lot of the students, again, is very interesting because a lot of the students might not necessarily like the term sales, but if they have a term but there's no quota carrying for them, mm -hmm. they would be perfectly fine in doing a great job in doing everything else but ask for the deal. So my yeah. question actually is link the content, of course, no, it's interesting to say you will do this, but do you actually also recruit actively for customer success or client services, or is it done as an internal move that you have to prove yourself with, uh, you're not calling customers before you can actually go on and take that responsibility? Yeah. Short answer is both. Um, yeah. So we have entry level customer success roles that my teammate Kirsten recruits for. Um, and then we also do have it as either a lateral move or a promotion. So one of the cool things within Gartner that you saw with both Austin and myself is that we both had the opportunity to move from sales into talent acquisition. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it, it was a pretty lateral move at, in terms mm -hmm. of the level I was at. Um, and the same thing goes for customer success, right? You can come in as a, an associate level, or you can make that transition from um, sales to like a leadership partner or a client partner level. So, and, and Katie, to kind of talk about client success at Gartner, um, isn't that, so that's a, you can do that a little bit in account management, correct? Mm -hmm. So yep. I would say just like the, the way that Gartner views it, is it's like client success, 
then you like then I would say account management is like you do that plus you're also selling and finding new accounts. So the account manager role of Gardner is like one of the cool like hey I keep saying cool but it's one of the, <laughs> it's one of my favorite roles like that a new college grad can do because hmm. it's a promotion from this customer success but you're you're also selling you're making really good money um, and you don't have like and Katie correct me wrong here. You don't have to make like a thousand cold calls. You make like no. your prospecting list is about 20 customers, correct? Like 20 mm -hmm. customers you can reach yeah. out to, and then you have about 10 to 15 customers that are yours. Yeah. So yeah. that is, I think that's what you're kind of trying to, to say there is the account manager has all those customer success um, functions, but they do manage those accounts. And I think what's cool too yeah. is um, that from account management, let's say you start as an account manager and you decide you don't really like asking for deals, don't like prospecting, yeah. well, you go to customer success. Let's say you love prospecting and don't like the account management, cool, you could get promoted into business development. So it's a I really mean, good entry point too. Um, for someone like me who started without really knowing what sales was, you got exposure to lots of different day-to-day -day activities that were involved in a sales yeah. role. Now, the reason why I'm saying is that because in my class, I will be talking about customer success and I do have students who at least have an idea about what sales is about. They think at least. Mm -hmm. but so it, It's always a fact that you can move from client services to customer success. Yeah. But I think you'll also start having much more success once people start doing client services because they think they don't want to do sales and yeah. they realize they're good at it and they can see the money is better on the other side because... What we are hearing, for example, um, just to give you an idea, we, I was talking to a company the other day from San Francisco, maybe not the ideal time now, but they say you could just be a high school, so you could be a, a college graduate. They're so desperate for customer success roles. And they say you don't need to have targets, revenue targets, that they can make around $75,000. Again, San Francisco is not much, right? But the mm -hmm. idea is that if I don't like the sales part of it, that if I'm only getting a book of customers where the customer already has purchased from us. So again, as I said, for us from this class, what we're trying to say is that we're going to say, you have all these actions. We are looking at customer or client services as sales enablement. That is, it's supposing to drive sales for your organization. And of course, and my, our interest is that, yes, if we hire great SDRs or account execs, great, but if it also means that if we can become a source of customer or client services for you, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, that would be money well spent for Gartner. So that's the way we are looking at it as well. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, anyway, so no, but thank you so much for both of your times. Uh, so essentially, okay. if there are additional questions from the students, I'll pass it on to you. Perfect. Uh, so essentially, anything, sorry. No, I just wanted to close out again by saying thank you for having mm -hmm. us. Um, students, if you are interested in a future role with Gartner, internship full time, or just want to talk about professional development, feel free to use my contact information. Um, there's also a registration link on the slide deck that Deva has access to as well. Um, if you want to go ahead and put your information in there, that's a quick way for me to get a hold of you. Thank you so much, Katie and Austin. Thank yeah. you very much. Absolutely. Okay.